we are going to be doing the Nicki Minaj iceberg. I have been really excited to do a comprehensive deep dive video on the Queen for a long time. And I think that No Ghost Writer is a channel that definitely started because I wanted to share my knowledge and passion for you know, Nikki's work and career. And I think that this is a great opportunity and time to do that um, and to just, yeah, talk about just everything <laughs> in relation to Nicki Minaj. I was inspired to do this video by An Absurd Existence on YouTube. I saw their video on MF Doom and the MF Doom iceberg and I thought, that's really cool. I wanna do one just like that for Nicki Minaj. And I saw that the iceberg thing, like it's like a conspiracy thing. And I like that because I know a lot of information about Nicki and I think this is gonna be a great fun way that we're gonna break it down. So we start at the first level, the very tip of the iceberg, which is her rap name, Nicki Minaj. So Nicki Minaj, her actual name is Onika Tanya Mirage and she didn't actually originally intend on rapping with the name Nicki Minaj. If you listen to Autobiography, which is an unreleased pre-debut track, so for when Nicki was in her come up uh, mixtape era, she describes it as the autobiography of Nicki Mirage. And if you check out the video from her podcast with Big Fendi, who was um, instrumental at the beginning of Nicki Minaj's career, they actually talk about the fact that she thought that using Nicki Mirage, you know, her name was fine, but Fendi wanted her to use Nicki Minaj. And there's been different places and times where Nicki has explained why she calls herself that, but during the come up, she used to say it's Nicki Minaj because she gotta eat in these rap bitches with a nasty flow. So that is the origin and background behind her rap name being Nicki Minaj. Into the second topic on the first tier and tip of the Nicki Minaj iceberg, her iconic bitches is my son's bar. So Nicki's used the bitches is my son's or some variation of bitches is my son in her music at least 50 times according to an interview that she did with Genius in 2018. All these bitches is my son. We know at the time of recording this video in 2022 that she's used it a whole um, ton since. Um, most definitely she has because in Fractions released last year, um, she said, if you was trying to be my son, then mission complete. <laughs> so this bar has become pretty much iconic. Um, in Nikki's lyrical arsenal. And the actual origin behind it, she explained in that Genius interview, actually came from something that she heard P Diddy say, um, and she elaborated on it for herself. So she was very inspired by hearing Diddy, you know, talking about how, you know, all these people are his son and, you know, the confidence behind that. And so she took that on and uh, made it her own in a really incredible way. Um, so the Bitches Is My Son's bar is inspired by Diddy. Another piece of context behind that is that there was a period of time where Diddy did manage Nicki Minaj. And I think it was around this period of time that she was inspired by that. So shout out to Diddy um, for being the inspiration behind the Bitches Is My Son's bar, which is iconic. Now getting into the next topic, and that is her rapper ad-libs. So Nicki has different rapper ad-libs that she uses. Her main ones are and yeah. so the origins of these ad-libs are pretty much at the very beginning of Nicki Minaj's career. In fact, on her smash hit underground single, Itty Bitty Piggy, she actually uses all of the classic ad-libs that she would go on to use for the rest of her career in the outro. So that is a great indication of where she was going and also gives you the origin of most of her um, most iconic rapper ad-libs. And there's also a point to note that a lot of rappers do have, you know, like, sound tags that they use to recognize themselves um, and to announce themselves on a track. Um, we've seen, you know, recent ones, you've got Megan with her eh. <laughs> You know, that's Megan's. Um, but Nikki's one, she's got <laughs> 
So yeah, that's the origins behind Nicki's um, most popular and well-known rapper ad-libs. So the last topic at the top of the Nicki Minaj iceberg are her four studio albums and her long-awaited fifth studio album, also known as NM5. We actually shared our fantasy track list for NM5 um, on our Instagram um, and on Twitter, so I'll put a link to that post so you can go check it out. Tell us what you think um, about our track list. Um, but her fourth albums, uh, four albums, sorry, that she's published are um, Pink Friday, Pink Friday Roman Reloaded, The Pink Print, and Queen. Um, and these albums have sold millions and millions of, of, of units all around the world. Um, and they've had, you know, just an incredibly rich impact. Uh, there is lots of debate and contention amongst uh, Nicki Minaj's fans as to which is her best album. If you'd like for us to do an album breakdown on No Ghostwriter, please um, comment and let us know because, uh, yeah, we can definitely um, see about getting that put together. But her albums have all shown this variety to her, you know, hip hip hop and pop and shown that she can do both of them at once and i'm excited to see whether she leans more into that hip hop direction for the fifth album we'll wait and see but um yeah the tip of the Nicki minaj iceberg ends with you know her her four existing albums and her long-awaited fifth album. So and let's get into the second level of the iceberg and get a bit deeper into our dive into Nicki Minaj. So getting into the second tier of the Nicki Minaj iceberg, we're getting a bit deeper into things and sharing knowledge that isn't so general. So the Barbs, if you're not familiar, um, are Nicki Minaj's fans or stands. Um, and Nicki's relationship with the Barbs is honestly one of the strongest um, and most prominent um, features of her career. Uh, her fan base has very much rode for her and supported her through every peak and the few, very few, but still difficult troughs that she's experienced in her career. And cultivating this fan base was largely possible because of Nikki's excellent use of social media. Text me your Twitter. I'm gonna follow you. I'm gonna tell Pink my Barbies. Barbies. You're here? You're gonna yeah. tell who? My Barbies to follow you. That's her, those are her minions. That's what I'm telling you. They're psychopath. They're psychopathic. I'm telling you, I'm out the loop. I'm like. Psychopathic 15 year old girls. They don't speak English. They speak oh, English. ooh, that's slick. Yeah, I mean, you better not. That's listen. slick. Don't call them psychos. No, they're, okay, they're not psychos. They're loyal and dedicated. They're loyal and dedicated. Yeah. They're like the internet, so they're loyal and dedicated. And they'll the like. Shout average. out to the Barbies. Yeah, they'll beat you up. They'll I mean, walk to the death of And I'll enjoy it. Minaj. So into the actual meaning of the term barbs, Nicki Minaj has always had different monikers that she's used to refer to herself. And at the start of her career, she used to refer to herself as Nikki the Harajuku Barbie. Um, she was very inspired by Harajuku fashion. That's that era, remember that Gwen Stefani era? Cause I've been acting like someone may fall on the floor and stuff and maybe that's the reason I've been acting so cold. If I could escape. Yeah, that was the, the fashion <laughs> at the time. Yeah, Nikki was the Harajuku Barbie, but she was also the head Barbie. And that HB, head Barbie, um, head Barb, you know, that's where her fans, uh, the name came from. You know, she has the Barbs and then the Ken Barbs, um, also known as Kens. So she's got her Barbs and she's got her Kens, but she's always the, the big Barbie. So that's the reason why Nicki Minaj's fans are called the Barbs. And make sure you check out our videos on No Go Strider on the Barbs. We talked about 
some of the recent challenges that the fan base has faced and some of the fracture and uh, decline, um, not in the size of the fan base, but more between fans. You know, there's been a few difficult things. So make sure you check out our content if you'd like to get an even deeper dive into Nicki Minaj and her barbs. So onto the second topic in the second tier of the Nicki Minaj iceberg, her world tours. So Nicki Minaj is extremely unique um, and has made history as I believe being the only female rapper in history to tour a solo world tour. Round of applause for the queen of rap. Nikki's world tours have seen her take her music all around the world. You know, she's got a really strong international fan base. I have seen her myself in Europe for the Queen tour. If I can find my Queen tour footage, I'm going to put it into this video because I knew I was saving it for a reason. I hope I can find it. But yes, I've seen her live, you know, and uh, Nikki's, Nikki's, you know, presence around the world is so felt and so real and so raw. Like she can create a mob. Like honestly, if you told me Nicki Minaj was in London, the way I would run, you would not be able to stop me. So I just think it's worthwhile acknowledging that Nicki's got this excellent international impact. And um, the fact of the matter is that she's really pushed female rap to every corner of the earth. And you'll have a hard time, you know, outside of America. I think sometimes, especially if you're in North America, you may not understand just how much Nicki Minaj is loved all around the world. Like you, your the culture very well may have been cultivated and, you know, had its strongest roots in North America. But Nicki Minaj means a lot to a lot of people all around the world. Like they know Nicki everywhere, you know, and that is international impact. And that's on Queen of Rap. So into topic number three for the second tier of the Nicki Minaj iceberg are her alter egos. So Nicki has got plenty of alter egos. Um, make sure you check out our video on No Ghostwriter where we did a general video about rap alter egos, what makes them good, um, what makes it bad when rappers try and do alter egos. And also check out our video on Roman Zelansky that we recently posted. Roman Zelansky is one of Nikki's most prominent alter egos and the one that I think most people are familiar or aware of. Make sure you check out those pieces of content. So Nikki's alter egos have been present pretty much throughout her career and come up. Um, you've, you've always heard the different um, flows and tones of her voice. So generally speaking, her main ones, I'd say the ones that you recognize the easiest, um, you've got Barbie. So that is when you hear Nikki rapping with a slightly like, almost like she's singing a lullaby or she's singing a nursery rhyme. That's how you know she's rapping like Barbie. Um, but, but Barbie has range, you know, she can get, she can do trap Barbie, you know, she can really get like aggressive. And I would say a lot of Roman Reloaded has some of those elements in there and Pink Friday as well. So you've got Barbie, you've got Roman Zelansky. Essentially Roman Zelansky is, uh, well, was because it's rumored that uh, Nikki said that he died some have speculated he's still locked up in boarding school in England, but Nikki's alter ego, Roman Zelansky, a male alter ego, and he is behind some of Nikki's most lyrically vicious um, songs like Roman's Revenge, Roman Holiday, uh, yeah, she, Roman in Moscow, you know, the Roman, the Roman era <laughs> was, a moment um, for alter egos in hip hop. Uh, make sure you check out our playlist, our No Ghostwriter playlist, Think Pink, where we've got cuts uh, from the Roman era and we've also put in um, cuts from female rappers who are inspired by Nikki's alter egos and what Nikki did with her alter egos. Uh, so yeah, make sure you check out our Think Pink playlist um, for more of that content. Because the way Nikki set up her alter egos and the way that she's consistently stayed with them, you know, as she's gone through different things, you know, you've had Chun-Li um, during the hate train and we'll talk about the hate train more, but 
Chun-Li was, is, you know, the bad guy. Um, then you've got Queen um, from the Queen era, so Queen Sleeve. Um, and every time Nikki enters like a new era or a new like alter ego era, she gets a chain. So she's got a Barbie chain, she's got a Chun Li chain, she's got a Queen chain. I think she's got a pink print chain. I don't know whether she's actually did. I, I'm not 100% sure whether she's actually got the pink print chain or whether I think like Lil Uzi got one. But I've seen a pink print chain <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, essentially Nikki's had these alter egos and she presents them differently. You know, you can hear an alter ego from, usually from the sound of the voice, but often she'll just say, like, you know, this is Chun-Li. She'll refer to herself as the alter ego. And I wonder if maybe that's the reason why she won't necessarily go back to Roman, because I don't know whether I can see Nikki referring to herself as Roman anymore. But hey, it's all open, it's time will tell. So the story of the MonsterVerse is that Nicki Minaj had gone to Kanye West's studio in Hawaii and he had her in the studio just going crazy, just writing and writing and he wanted her to give more and more like aggression and everything and she was like making like monster noises, like she really got into it and she basically <laughs> didn't have as much control um, over the final mixes and stuff as she does now, obviously. She, you know, she was a debut artist and she was, you know, she said that he used, you know, different cuts and he like cut it together in a way that, you know, just really just expanded it and elevated it. But, you know, she wrote that verse right there. Rick Ross saw her write the verse, I do believe that he was actually physically there and saw it. But yeah, it just goes to show that, you know, Nikki's lyrical prowess is incredible. You know, Monster is considered by many to be one of the best rap verses of all time. That's just on period. And uh, another interesting story about the Monster verse is that it was actually so good that Kanye almost kept it off the album. <laughs> Uh, and he's done it again with New Body, which is another iconic unreleased track. Uh, but, well, this one was actually unreleased, but Monster almost was unreleased. Make sure you check out our video that we did on No Ghostwriter, where we actually talked about five verses that are arguably better than Monster. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions on those. In summary, Monster is, you know, one of Nicki's most iconic verses. And for the story that I just told, you can see why there's so much power and history behind it. Fun fact, Nikki didn't know that Jay-Z was actually going to be on uh, Monster, so she only knew when she heard it <laughs> that she'd actually rapped uh, with Jay-Z. And then what's really cool is that after that, uh, Nikki performed at the Yankee Stadium with Jay-Z and Kanye West, and Jay-Z was there hyping her up, rapping bar for bar her verse on Monster, you know who else gets that treatment in their debut year when they're a rookie? You know, Nikki the Minaj. Incredible scenes, incredible scenes. And we just talked about alter egos. So in Monster, that's really when you get a blend because you get uh, Roman and you also get Barbie. So let me get this straight. Wait, I'm the rookie with my features and my shells 10 times. You pay 50K for a verse, no album out. Yeah, my money's so tall that my Barbie's gonna climb it. Then, you know, we're into Roman. Yeah, she's just incredible. Like, she's literally the queen of rap. <laughs> like, for real. <laughs> now, on to Nicki Minaj's relationship with Drake. So, Drake is another rapper that Lil Wayne um, picked and put under his wing. So, essentially, that meant that Nicki and Drake were at the same, like, Lil Wayne boot camp. Uh, Nikki tells stories about how her, Drake, and you know other Young Money artists would be in the studio just writing raps, writing raps, writing raps. Um, and Nikki and Drake have had an interesting relationship. Drake's told the story of the first time that he met Nicki Minaj um, on a tour bus or on tour, um, and she friend zoned him immediately. Um, but they've had an interesting relationship. Check out our video we did. Um, on Drake and Nikki's relationship during the most vulnerable time in her career, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but yeah, they've they've definitely had this on and off and ongoing and offgoing <laughs> relationship. Um, 
and there's a lot of history behind it but essentially they've got a lot of love for each other you know drake appeared on seeing green which was great um you know that was really amazing to see that that big three you know drake nikki wayne as it should be like it was in the old days um that was incredible to see and i think a lot of people have said, you know, when it comes to Nikki and Drake, that they expected that they would be together in the end. I don't, I never saw that, you know. Let me know what you think in the comments, but I never saw that. I never thought, I, I never look, literally saw them together. Like, I know the songs showed that relationship, but what I think is special about their relationship is that he is her male counterpart, she is his female counterpart you know, and they've got love and respect for each other, they do. And I think, I think that young money loyalty will always be there. It may not have manifested the way, you know, we wanted it to manifest. We wanted it to be a bit more clear and direct, but I think that, yeah, I think that above all, they do love and respect each other. And I think that's the core thing that they both get from growing up under Wayne and coming into the game under Wayne is that yeah, it's a brother-sister thing. So that's a summary of Nikki's relationship with Drake. Okay, so grab your scuba gear. We are officially going even deeper into this deep dive into Nicki Minaj and her career. And we are going into the third level of the iceberg. So first up, we've got the color pink and Barbie. So. If you aren't familiar, Nicki Minaj has essentially branded the color pink. She's had so many different elements of pink in her um, career branding, not only the fact that she had the iconic pink hairstyle, so when she was rapping on the Come Up DV doing Itty Bitty Piggy and everything like that that we discussed for Mixtape Nicki, her iconic hairstyle was this um, black bang with this pink under hair highlight. And when I say the girls all wanted pink hair like Nicki Minaj, they all wanted pink hair like Nicki Minaj. Um, and she, of course, expanded that when she launched her debut album, Pink Friday. Obviously, the entire theme of the album was pink. You can also see, like, with No Ghost Writer, the ode to Nicki we've got with all of the pink lights um, and stuff in the background. So, Nicki expanded the color pink, um, and she really you know, just embodied it. You know, she liked pink because she said, you know, it's her favorite color. She likes that it's girly and it's fun. It's very feminine. And I think the color pink and the Barbie aesthetic, which we'll discuss, is very much a part of Nicki Minaj's brand because Nicki is an ultra feminine, um, you know, icon. She, she embodies femininity in hip hop um, and the femme, in hip hop isn't necessarily pink. Um, hip hop isn't pink, you know, with all that pink connotes, hip hop doesn't lend itself towards that. You know, hip hop is, we've talked about in previous videos, you know, it's often associated with the masculine and the masculine is often not associated with colors like pink. So for Nikki to be, um, you know, the ultra feminine, like rapper, and brand herself with pink was special and it was important. Um, and I think the fact that she expanded that into, you know, she had the Pink Beats pill, she's done MAC collections, she had the OPI, um, she's developed it into fragrance. It just shows that Nikki is a brander. You know, she was here to build a brand and her Barbie brand is a big part of that because Obviously, the Barbie aesthetic stems from who is Barbie? You know, Barbie has always been that I idealize as the ultimate, the ultimate woman. So for her to be the black Barbie, she's saying that she's the ultimate woman in, in her own way, so as a black woman. And, you know, Barbie is beautiful, she's accomplished, she can do everything, um, everyone loves her, you know, she's got Ken. You know, Barbie just has it together. So 
for Nikki to brand herself as Barbie and then to be so successful that Mattel made a Nicki Minaj Barbie, you know, just shows that Nikki is a champion brander. And so the color pink and Barbie, you know, using that as her name, using that as an aesthetic, um, was very smart to solidify her in the public consciousness. You know, it's she's so synonymous with the color pink now. I can literally, let me go get my Fendi Prince on shoes so you guys can see. So these shoes here are from Nikki's collaboration with Fendi and you can see that they're pink. Um, and we're gonna talk about this Fendi collaboration uh, for the next part of the iceberg. But what I wanted to say here is that, you know, for Nikki to brand herself so strongly, that she, you know, creates a pink pump, an entire uh, Fendi prints on pink inspired range with one of the world's biggest luxury fashion houses, just shows you how solidified Nikki's brand is. And it's so exciting to have a female rapper who is, you know, this much of a mogul. Um, so yeah, so that's all about the color pink and Nikki calling herself Barbie. So that leads us nicely onto fashion icon, which is the next part of this level of the Nicki Minaj iceberg. And Nikki is a fashion icon, so a lot of people don't know, uh, but Nikki, like I just showed you those shoes from the Fendi Prince on collaboration, but Nikki's been very active in the fashion world. Uh, she frequently attends fashion weeks um, and sits front row. When I'm sitting with Anna, I'm really sitting with Anna. Ain't a metaphor punch, and I'm really sitting with Anna. <laughs> so she's really sitting with Anna Wintour. Uh, so since her debut era, she's been, you know, a hot commodity in the fashion world. She's tried different types of fashion as well. And I think that's what's made her so iconic. You know, she's taken risks. She's tried things that a lot of people might think, oh, whoa, rappers can't wear that or I can never wear that. You know, Nikki's done that. Her camp era was, you know, really special. Um, and I did mention in one of our recent videos on whether uh, female rappers are always gonna be controlled by men in the industry, how Nicki challenged the male gaze um, by almost desexualizing her dressing. And producing her debut album, she didn't have any sexual references on there, you know, not that many. And her fashion and her dressing really set her apart and showed the world that she was here to deliver something different and she was here to do something different. And I think that really comes across. So Nikki has had, like we talked about, collaborations with Fendi. That Fendi Prince on collaboration um, was iconic. Um, it essentially was the first time we've ever had a luxury brand do a named collection with a female rapper and as far as rappers and luxury brands go, you can see that there is an obvious relationship because rappers are always talking about the brands they're wearing. You know, they're talking about that sort of coveting thing. But with Nikki, she has developed these great relationships with different designers. So she's got, um, like we talked about that relationship with Fendi. She's got a relationship with Donatella Versace. Um, she sat next to Anna Wintour when she was a debut in the game. Um, she has, sat at Marc Jacobs, um, she has sat at Monse, she's done a um, unreleased fashion track for Monse, um, and like I said, she constantly kills Fashion Week. So I just wanted to talk about Nikki as a fashion icon because a lot of people sleep on the fact that she literally had a collaboration with Fendi. Like that's not a small thing, it's Fendi, you know, that is a Fendi fact. Just shout her out for being a fashion icon and that is that on Nicki's role as a fashion icon. Okay, so now that we've looked at Nicki Minaj, the fashion icon, let's take a look at Nicki Minaj as the pink print for female rap. So something that you're gonna hear fans of Nicki Minaj, the Barb's, um, say, and you're gonna hear Nicki Minaj say herself over and over again, is that she is the pink print for female rap. So breaking down what that means, when Nicki Minaj says the pink print, she's referring to Jay-Z's iconic album, The Blueprint, which is considered by many to be one of the best rap albums of all time. 
So if Jay-Z is the blueprint for how to be a successful rapper, Nicki Minaj is the pink print for how to be a successful female rapper. If you remember, because we talked about at the start of this level, Nicki Minaj branding the color pink. So pink and the pink print is Nicki's way of taking the blueprint and developing it for herself. And I just wanted to make a side point here that there is this common theme running through Nicki's life um, and career as a rapper where she takes um, ideas and concepts and principles from some of rap's biggest male moguls and successes and she develops that into an aspiration for women and that's why above all Nicki Minaj's career is representative of female empowerment in hip-hop because were it not for Nicki Minaj wanting to take a slice of the pie that the men in hip-hop were profiting from then it's very unlikely that the pink print for a female rap mogul as we have today would exist so when Barb's talk about Nicki Minaj as the pink print for female rap, it's more than just saying that, you know, there's, there are girls out there that want to look like Nicki Minaj or want the success. Who would not want to be worth $100 million? Um, but it's more to acknowledge the fact that Nicki Minaj made a way where a way did not previously exist. And although a lot of people have, you know, acknowledged and said that, you know, other female rappers have been successful, but how many women in hip hop have been successful as an active female rapper for the length of time that Nicki Minaj has and sustained dominance the way that she has independently, you know? That is something that is worth, you know, giving her her snaps for and is a big reason why the Barb's will probably go to war if you try and challenge them that Nicki Minaj is the pink print for female rap and that's myself included. So the last um, item on the third level of the Nicki Minaj iceberg is Mogul Nicki. I think that we've discussed a lot of the different mogul moves she's made um, and why she's the pink print, but I wanted to point you towards our video on why Nicki Minaj didn't sign the female rapper 360 deal. I think it's very important to have a historical examination of 360s um, and essentially why different rappers feel that they should sign them um, and I'd also recommend that you check out uh, the episode of my podcast Clout Is Not Currency um, where we talk about Russ and his comments to artists to not sign 360s and to sponsor themselves and all of that stuff in conversation so I just wanted to point you to that because as far as Nikki being a mogul um, you know I think it's been very well established but I just think that a lot of people forget that she's done so many things. You know, there's fashion, makeup, um, liquor, because she's got mixed Moscato. Um, you know, there's so many different things that she's done to put her brand out there and, you know, generate as much income as she can. And you can see that pink print being done again and again. You know, people wanting to try and get that same level of being a mogul. So thank you, Nikki, for having the audacity to look at the rap game and say that you wanted to be a mogul the same way that there are men in the game, male rappers who are moguls. I think it's inspirational. Okay, okay, okay. If you've made it this far into the video, then I know you are dedicated to knowing the real Bob Intel. We've weeded out the people who weren't that invested in Nikki. Maybe they've learned a few things. But right now, I am know I'm talking to a serious person. So, welcome to the fourth tier of the Nicki Minaj iceberg. This is the information context that Barb's, you know, this is why Barb's Barb. This is why Barb's Barb. So, let's get into it. Um, and let's talk about the different topics in the fourth tier, fourth and final tier of the Nicki Minaj iceberg. Let's go. So the first item on the Nicki Minaj um, iceberg, the fourth tier, is the fight for streaming rights. So a little known fact, but one that motivates a lot of barbs to go extra hard for Nicki Minaj with streams and sales online and physically, 
is the fact that she was one of the artists who were instrumental and successful in challenging streaming services over their rate of remuneration for artists for their music content that was put on their sites. So artists haven't always been paid for their streams and even the amount that they get paid now, which is a fraction um, of a dollar, per stream isn't even that significant, but it's a lot more than it used to be. Prior to the legal challenge that Nicki Minaj and other artists brought, label, record labels were losing and artists were losing money because streaming platforms were essentially just file sharing and sharing, you know, digital versions of music to their audience with artists not getting compensated. So what was happening is that a lot of the artist's music was being played on these sites but wasn't being accredited to the artist and wasn't making the artist money. I remember using Spotify right in the early days and definitely remember seeing like lots of different types of music on there. So in terms of those rights, you know, the right to be paid for your streams, the right for streams to be counted as a form of a sale for the sake of Billboard and other chart notification platforms. Um, I want to point here to our episode of Clout Is Not Currency, episode number seven, where we talk about changes to Billboard rules around sales and streaming. So essentially these rights that are now vested in streams, so the fact that artists can earn money from streams, streams can count towards album units, song credits and all of that, is in large part because of Nicki Minaj and the hard work that she did challenging streaming services and being successful in that challenge. And I also wanted to relate here to her early founding investment into Tidal, um, which was Jay-Z's um, artist-focused streaming service that intended to pay artists a larger amount on the dollar for their streams. In episode one of Clout Is Not Currency podcast, I also talked about um, Tidal and its recent updates to allow fans to generate income for their faves. So essentially, if it wasn't for Nicki Minaj, a lot of your faves wouldn't be able to chart and make money off of streams um, because everything would still be all about physical sales or digital sales, which a lot of artists can't sustain, you know, to that significant level without a significant amount of promotion, push, investment and placement. So uh, Chance the Rapper actually shouted out Nicki Minaj uh, for her involvement in that fight for streaming rights before. And uh, it just goes to show that Nicki is ultimately a champion in the music industry. She's challenged the music industry. She's been a challenger and it's had benefits that have gone across the entire spectrum of artists across the industry. So next we've got the 2017 to 2019 hate train. So we've done a very comprehensive and very full video on the hate train. So what I'll say here will be brief, but the hate train essentially is the colloquialism for this period of time in her career where Nicki Minaj was quite vulnerable. So Remy Ma dropped Sheetha in the spring of 2017 and essentially from that point Nicki Minaj had to be on the defensive or on the attack um, because she was getting you know from all angles a lot of you know negative you know just like negative um, disrespectful commentary from rap culture and this coincided with a few um, events like a series of events that made it all clear by the end of 2017 that so the hate train essentially came to be that in order for the industry to feel like it had removed Nicki Minaj's dominance over female rap it was necessary to position someone to quote unquote challenge her now the problem is that this has been attempted many many times there are multiple female rappers including the british female rapper lady leisha who have spoken out about being offered you know deals on the basis that they diss Nicki minaj so within the industry it was quite well known that 
you know, a lot of people didn't like the fact that Nicki Minaj was so consistently popular. You know, at this point, she'd had seven to eight years of like complete dominance. And, you know, people didn't want to see that continue. So the hate train essentially represents a multi pronged attack on Nicki Minaj's uh, brand, character, reputation, her physical safety, um, you know, her mental health. It was a lot, you know, and it was very hard as fans um, to see that happening um, and to feel almost, you know, and it wasn't almost because it was true, to feel like it was us versus the music industry or Nicki Minaj versus the music industry. And that's a lot of what the hate train came to represent. Um, you know, Nicki felt very vulnerable, very much on the defense and you know, it was just a constant, you know, barrage of Nicki Minaj is over, Nicki Minaj is over, Nicki Minaj is over, Nicki Minaj is over, but she wasn't over. And luckily, you know, Nicki has a the world's best fan base, um, extremely dedicated and committed. And they bought, they streamed, they supported. So even without, you know, mainstream support, Nicki Minaj was still able to sustain her dominance. And that entire period of time was very intense, you know, very, you know, lots of strong passion and emotion. Um, one of the reasons being because of the next topic that I'm gonna discuss, which is her hiatuses. So in response to the hate train, and this wasn't the first time, but it was, you know, the first time um, Nicki had been away for this long, but Following the um, hate train and all of that stuff, by the end of 2017, Nicki Minaj was over it. Um, she could see that there was an intentional, you know, at attempt to remove her. She could see that, you know, she didn't really know who she could trust. And so she took this time to take a hiatus um, and to pause and leave the music industry um, and focus on herself. So this was, um, Honestly, Barb's are very triggered because you see Nikki posted this picture that was um, she posted this I believe in December um, and she did a remix with um, Lil Wayne five star remix on Dedication 6 the mixtape and she said um, tell them carry on they're gonna miss me when I'm gone I'm gone and then she actually left you know, she wasn't on social media, she didn't interact with the fans directly, and considering what we've talked about, direct interaction being at the core of Nikki's brand, you can see why her not talking to her fans, her not interacting online, it, she was gone, but that hate train was still very much in motion. So what I was saying earlier is that the hate train plus Nikki's hiatus sent the barbs into absolute overdrive and during the hiatus periods or during the entire hate, hate train but especially during the hiatus periods barbs you know went extremely hard for Nicki Minaj you know if people were writing slanderous articles we challenged them if people were you know disrespecting Nicki on social media we challenged it and that challenging that passion that dedication to protecting Nicki Minaj has been what's earned Barb's, you know, this reputation for being aggressive, but I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that actually it's in reference to the passion. Um, and it's also in reference to the fact that throughout the, part of the reason why Nicki Minaj went on hiatus and also one of the most problematic elements of the hate train was this idea that Nicki couldn't defend herself which is something that she brought up on Joe Budden's podcast, um, where she said, you know, how can it be that you're allowed to say what you want about me and speculate, but I'm not allowed to say back, um, you know, to tell you to stop. Like, I'm not allowed to say anything back to you. And that element of things is a large reason why I would say, you know, things like Queen Radio, are super important because they gave Nikki the opportunity to speak freely and candidly and to say her piece. You know, you need to challenge the way people talk and think about prominent black women. You need to challenge people and make sure that they remember that it's hard to get into the position where a lot of these women have gotten to, especially like Nicki Minaj. 
Um, and it, out of respect for that, we should never say that someone's career is over just because someone else comes in. It's just so damaging and harmful to women. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, you know, rap is sport and rap is competitive. So what we want to see is as many women competing as possible. You know, that's great, but that's not what the hate train and this whole era of time was really about. So it makes complete sense that Nikki distanced herself from social media and um, didn't return um, until she came back with the in April um, of 2018 with the uh, singles Chun Li and Barbie Tings. And if you'd like to see our video that we did on Nicki Minaj's longest music hiatus, then check that out on our channel. This next topic on the fourth tier of the Nicki Minaj iceberg has been addressed on the channel, but I'm going to quickly address it here. So Nikki's blackballing from radio. So blackballing from radio is essentially when radio DJs don't play your songs. Make sure you check out our video where we said, you know, is Nicki Minaj really blackballed or could she really have been blackballed? Does that still happen? Um, and so let us know what you think. Make sure you comment under that video. So essentially, um, being blackballed from radio meant that Nikki's tracks didn't have the general radio audience, you know, in that same way as somebody who does um, get distributed, you know, frequently on radio. So uh, the other element of not being on radio, it's not just the distribution, so somebody hearing your song, it's also uh, the fact that it counts, so all the spins count for charts. So if you're being played on radio over and over and over and over again, you're ranking up or racking up chart points. So that means that being blackboard from radio made Nicki Minaj vulnerable. And a lot of people wanted to try and like make jokes and whatever, but the takeaway point from her radio blackballing experiences has been that People don't think hard enough about where music comes from, you know? They don't think hard enough about how it's curated, why it's curated, you know, who actually has decided that you should hear this song. And I think if more people knew how frequent it is to have, you know, relationships or partnerships between radio stations and record labels and all of that stuff, then you know, you're being quite naive because the radio isn't necessarily an authority, an, a reliable authority on what good music is and what's, you know, actually worth a listen. It, it can be a good collection of what's been marketed the best and what's been paid for the most. So in that vein then, that's why it was absolutely iconic when Nicki Minaj reached number one with both Trolls and Say So because this was in large part because of her independent but extremely dedicated fan base um and we were able to you know put a lot of effort um behind that and behind those videos and i'm still to this day i'm still to this day gagged that nikki was pregnant in that trolls video because we had no idea so being blackballed from radio and not having access to the same radio audience as other people meant that when nikki minaj received two number ones with trolls and say so she did that through organic forms of support with her fans so streaming um, purchases of songs digitally and physically um, and it's interesting that now there have been changes to the rules around this so make sure you listen to episode 7 of Clout Is Not Currency podcast to get up to speed but it just showed that at the time you know Nikki can weaponize a fan base to buy music and that is something that a lot of artists want to have you know organically create a relationship with their fans that they know to buy the music to you know invest in them they don't just rely on radio um and that's the thing i i think that you 
If you're a radio fan, that's absolutely fine. So to get the background on Nicki Minaj's blackballing from radio and historical examples of where this happened in the past, then make sure you check out our video on whether or not Nicki Minaj was really blackballed from radio. Okay, so that concludes our video on the Nicki Minaj iceberg and all of the different topics that um, exist in the Nicki Minaj universe to get to know her better and to provide an authoritative contextual rundown of Nicki Minaj's career and background. Make sure that you like and comment and subscribe to No Ghostwriter and make sure you subscribe to us on Patreon as well. You get ad free access to our content and also you get exclusive behind the scenes content and footage and the opportunity to just be involved in the process whilst we put together our videos and do our research. Make sure that you also check out our radio. So we've got a 24 hour female rap radio. So that is at noghostwriter.com forward slash noghostwriter radio. Um, and we'd love to see you supporting that and getting on board. Click the link in the description to go directly to our Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok. Follow us on all of those platforms. We're posting international female rap content and just keeping you up to date with what's fresh. So I hope you enjoyed this video. It's been a long video. As you can see, I had to split recording over two days, um, but it's been worthwhile. And I'm really glad and happy that we've done this. And now this video is gonna be out there for anyone who wants to make a solid, you know, list of things they know and understand about Nicki Minaj and her career. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for watching. I've been your host, Blessing Makosha, and I'll see you in the next upload. Bye.